My name is Rachel Coker. I'm at Binghamton University. We'll be helping to keep things running on schedule and uh, facilitating some of the behind the scenes things for the meeting over the next few days. I'm going to turn things over to Bill Chen at this point for a more formal welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the 2021 Hydrogenous Integration Roadmap Conference. So I want to thank the Binghamton University for hosting the Zoom platform. And want to also to thank the IEEE Electronic Packaging Society, Santa Clara Valley Chapter for the logistics and for the registration and for publicity. So we spent 2020 in a, uh, a different environment that we have done before. It is the electronic products and electronic systems that keep us in this way. The rapid advancement of vaccine science is a collaboration, global collaboration among scientists and among scientist companies. And this is really an example of what we can be done when everybody work together. Now we are optimistic that we will meet face to face once more, that we will have a face to face symposium and workshop next time when we do it together and also do it together in a way that we show the advancement or collaboration of what we can do. So the agenda. I will first talk about the digital transformation. We'll talk about the release of the HRR at 2019. Then I will give some examples of the heterogeneous integration products rollout in 2020. And the important thing I want to talk about is how do we engage the total ecosystem? Then we we'll just review the workshops and webinars that we happened at 2020, and I will summarize. First of all, the, I want to show you the slide which illustrates the business disruption, illustrate the um, digital economy. On the left, you could see is uh, 10 largest companies, public companies by market capitalization. You could see oil companies, you could see banks, and then there was one company, Microsoft. That is what we will call tech companies today. Then if you look at 2016, five years ago, we have four companies, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Amazon. These are the companies that we, that 10 years after, 20, 10 years later, previously there was one, now there's four, and these are tech companies. But look at 2020, nine of the 10 companies, largest companies by market capitalization are all what we would say associated with this digital transformation. You have Apple, Microsoft, you could see a company called Tesla. And you also see a company called TSMC. There, so these are the companies that is fueling the direction of digital transformation in the global economy. And semiconductor is the foundational pillar. And the way that we live, learn, play, communicate are all changing. And data is a new oil to our society. So if data is a new oil, and then the data would, would need to be turned into intelligence, and you could see that MEMS and sensors, computing, and, um, and uh, data centers, and data intelligence, these are all companies that are in the, in the way of data to intelligence and intelligence to results for our society. 
I think it's important for us to understand that this new oil is data that this new oil is the data that is changing the world for us today. Here is a slide from Prismark. Prismark partners, what it show is the electronic industry forecast. It show that uh, the key drivers into the future of the semiconductors is automotive, is uh, data centers, and uh, um, we are seeing a real difference of what we have seen, seen before because the smartphones and the data centers and the automotive, these are going to be the industries for the future. Our roadmap was launched on October the 10th, 2019. 24 chapters, over 590 pages. They're available for free download and the long load link is shown over here. And I remembered that the number of downloads for the chapters has exceeded 30,000 and the number continued to increase. The, um, at the time when we had the press release, this is the press release from IEEE and I will reproduce it over here on the roadmap for the future. And this, it's important for us to talk about that the primary objective is pre-competitive collaboration among industry, academia, and um, research institute in order for us to accelerate progress. And the purpose of the roadmap is to offer professionals, industry, and research institute so that together we will have a strategic forecast over the next 15 years. And also for materials, emerging devices, devices the timeline is longer. It is sponsored by the Sri Chapel IEEE Society, Electronic Patterson Society, Electronic Device Society, Photonics, ASME, and SEMI. It covers the microelectronic industry. It articulates the state of art of advances in technology directions, significant roadblocks and potential solutions. 60% of our volunteers today in our roadmap effort are from industry, 30% academia, and 10% research, research institutes and government. So this is where a quick picture of the objective of the roadmap and how it is sponsored and, and very important, what is our objective? It is really for the industry, for our people, our professionals, and eventually is for the benefit of the society. We have these roadmap chapters that covers the total microelectronic technology ecosystem First, we have the drivers. We list six, six chapters will be on the market and system applications. And then we have the building blocks. The building blocks of the, uh, of the electronic uh, ecosystem. And then cross-cutting topics covering from materials, emerging material, research materials to devices, tests, supply chain security and thermal management. Then we have the integration processes, co-design and simulation. So these are the basic building blocks of the electronic systems, systems ecosystem. And for every, for every product that would be gone out into, into the uh, industry, these are the areas that need to be considered and covered. We start with the market system application, putting on the building blocks, cross-cutting topics, integration processes, co-design, and simulation. 
22 working groups collaborating in technology and science for the future, uh, for the heterogeneous future. Here is a picture of what I mentioned of our meeting um, one year and uh, four days ago. And uh, this is the way that our working group worked together. And this is the way that uh, I hope we will meet again next year. Innovation is bubbling up everywhere. And we're maintaining the pace of progress would require new materials types, new system architectures, and innovative ways for, for us to bring down the design cost and to have time to market and security. I will not cover all of those, but I, in the, but I do want to be able to cover a few of the state of the art of what had happened last year and our direction going forward. So first of all, of course, mobile. Mobile, the smartphone leads the uh, implementation of system and package, and particularly package on package. These are, these are three examples of three leading smartphones. And in the smart, every smartphone, we have a package on package and where the memory and processors are packaged together a great example of heterogeneous integration in SIP. And uh, all of you who has a smartphone have one of those in your, in your system. Package or package is a great example. And it is the most popular example of uh, what we will call heterogeneous integration. Here are two 5G millimeter wave antenna modules. On the right is the uh, antenna module that you shown in the Samsung Galaxy S10, um, S10 uh, smartphone. On the left is the uh, iPhone 12 Pro that's just been released. And that uh, you could see that these are very important part of SIP. These are very important part of hydrogenase integration, enabling the 5G millimeter wave in the smartphones today. I want to give two examples of what I will call the advanced package integration. And I will first show the example from AMD, and then I will show the example from uh, uh, Intel. So I would I would take some of the materials from a presentation by Brian Black at the IMAPS conference October 5 to 10 last year. So Brian first show what AMD has done starting from 2015 when they introduced the high-end Radeon graphics with high bandwidth memory in 2015. This is the first example of, um, of the processor and high bandwidth memory on Celica Interposer. And on the right, it, what he has shown is an MCN approach that uh, uh, for, in this case, homogeneous integration in which they bring four, they put four dies into into a single package in order to enjoy the, the yield improvement for the large die, uh, in, over the large monolithic die. So if you look at right hand corner in the bottom, you could see that what he said is that the cost of this package is reduced from, if the monolithic is one, then the cost in the, in the um, dividing into the small dice is 0.59, significant improvement in the cost reduction in the way of 
dividing up into small chiplets. So, so this is the first 2015 and 2016. The next slide, what he showed is the 2019, the next generation of the epic processes. In this way, if you look at the slide on the right, you could see that what is shown is the significant improvement in the cost in reduction compared to the monolithic case. At the same time, he showed that on the left, the advantage of uh, the seven nanometer compute efficiency. So what he's saying is that using chaplets in the second generation EPIC processor, he has both the enjoy the, the improvement for, from the seven nanometers, as well as enjoy the ability to have a lower cost and faster time to market. So heterogeneous integration is, is demonstrated in this paper by Brown Black that how you can improve and uh, how you can improve and take advantage of both the uh, uh, compute efficiency of the um, of the single lower um, node as well as the cost reduction and time to market. And then he show in the future how he could do 10x improvement in bandwidth in, in looking at 3D. Okay, so this is the uh, Brian Black from um, AMD. Next, I want to show a, I want to show as example, this is taken from a presentation by Ravi Mahajan uh, called the Advanced Packaging Architecture for Heterogeneous Integration. That is the uh, at the uh, um, at the um, workshop at Binghamton University on October eighth, twenty twenty, last year. Um, so what he showed the different examples of EMIB and Favoris and co-EMIB. So in this presentation, what he specifically talked about was improvement in the um, bandwidth. And uh, this is the ex example that he showed the peripheral and area contact for 2D and 3D architectures and the uh, detailed description of, of what he has presented over here may be found in chapter 20, 22 in this uh, hydrogenous integration roadmap. If you look at chapter 22, you will see what he has shown in terms of several generations of, um, um, of the interconnect and uh, um, several generation interconnect and as well as the uh, improvement into the bandwidth. These are really very important for us to recognize that, that in the one case shown in by um, AMD, now in the second case shown by Intel, uh, two major IDMs are launching their direction in heterogeneous integration, improving cost, improving performance, and, uh, and particularly important to show is that in the case of Ravi Mahajan's talk, you could see that what he talked about is packaging architecture. On the presentation by um, Brian Black, actually is also in the packaging packaging architecture. So what we are talking about over here is that we have a packaging architect working with a system architect, working with a device architect so that they could all come together and said, how do we get them moving into, um, how can we get them together so that this collaboration can work together? This is particularly important in the area of the single chip node semiconductors so that we can 
work together among the industry, engaging the total ecosystem. The uh, packaging is stand between the device and between the systems and the packaging architect and packaging ecosystem need to be engaged in total. And our roadmap show the engaging the total ecosystems. For example, such as thermal management, power delivery, 2D, 3D test, security, architectures, code design, and multi-physics simulation. Many more, as we have shown over here in the 22 different chapters. So if we look at what the, what the end user's perspective, this is uh, Cliff Young at Google at Samarkand West 2019. He talked about the use of increasing power of available ICs. Different ICs he can procure from different places to put into a single package. The innovation of the main path, that is not to use a single SLC and true cool design. So he said deep learning has reinvigorated hardware and he showed the three generations of a Google Tensor Processor units. So we could see that Google is already practicing what we have just talked about on heterogeneous integration. Now, I just want to go through quickly the, the uh, workshops and conferences that we have done. And uh, this is the effort that all of us in the technical working groups are working together in, in bringing in the message of heterogeneous integration to the, our community in Semiconct, in, in, in the uh, ECTC, EPTC, and in all in different conferences. We're coming, would be uh, um, in March uh, at uh, EDTM, uh, IMAPS, URSIM, ICEP, ECTC, so all of us working together, uh, bringing in the message of uh, heterogeneous integration, as well as seeking feedback from the audiences, from the participants. We have a set of webinars we have given, and uh, the webinars are resources for education and training. So the future at the ERI Summit Plenary, Last year, Philip Wang, um, professor at the Stanford University and also TSMC chief scientist, he said the future is system integration. Ed Sperling, editor-in-chief at Semiconductor Engineering, new demand for customization is spreading. There will still be a handful of billion units, but the majority of chips being designed and sold in 2021 will be beyond will be in lots of thousands and perhaps millions. And then we have a quote from Yin Chen um, at ASC, tremendous optimism of the innovation in 3D packaging industry in heterogeneous integration journey. And finally, from G. Manocha, you are the enabler to envision the future via heterogeneous integration roadmap. So in summarize, we're at a unique point in time where the business disruption for digital transformation converge with technology chaos close to the end of Moore's law. When we say technology chaos, it's not bad. Technology chaos is where the innovation will come up. Technology chaos represent many of us thinking working together, collaborating in developing new ideas. Since the release of the roadmap, we are making a mark in this global electronics ecosystem. Our integration roadmap, heterogeneous integration roadmap is off to a very strong start. We are confident that the whole of HRR is greater than the sum of the individual parts and the roadmap progress of the, of the industry into the bright future as Moore's law have done in the last 56 years. Let us hope that we shall meet face to face again in the not too distant future. And as we 
mentioned before, not too distant future, and perhaps at the next meeting, we will meet together and also have a wine tasting together. So thank you very much. Yeah, we'll see. In the meantime, Bill Chen, there is a question for you in the chat. Um, it says, it appears companies like Broadcom are, pl are playing a big part in realizing HIR, but their role is unclear from your presentation. Could you comment on that? Um, I think all of the comp companies, including Broadcom, uh, are moving into HIR, but I only have 25 minutes today. And so I just took two examples from it. No, I, I don't want to give the impression that only two companies. I, I do want to, to mention that these two presentations from, from Brown Black <coughs> and Ravi are just examples that I picked out to illustrate. Hi, this is Andrew Fung from CMC Microsystems. I'd like to ask a question. The HIR is published and in many chapters, and it's a quite a large document on the whole, right? How do you envision ideally that an organization or a technology developer would use the roadmap each time it's published? At, as, at what point in their activities would this information intercept and influence what they're doing? Well, I, that is the great questions. What, what we see is the roadmap would our roadmap would continue to evolve. The, you could see if you um, review the different chapters, you will see that what we have today are A, a uh, um, description of the state of art, B, it the projection of what some of the major difficulties are and then where are the potential solutions? So what we could see is that <clears throat> these are the areas that our roadmap authors working together believe that what would be the next step and where are the roadblocks? And so this would be a great place for the companies to see that these are open pre-competitive areas. Perhaps they could work with the, um, their suppliers, such as materials and equipment, and said, look, how do we work together and uh, address this? The other thing would be to say that, how do we reach out to the uh, universities and research institutes and so that we can together build the future. So, so this is a pre-competitive roadmap. And what we could see is that the company roadmaps and our pre-competitive pre -com roadmap could eventually be a directions all going together into the future. There's Chris Bailey here. Uh, just, just following on from that question, you, you mentioned uh, research institutes and universities. And of course, what's very important for them is uh, government funding. Um, uh, do, you, do you see this roadmap helping inform funding agencies, government funding agencies in the future in prioritizing how they fund research? Absolutely. I'm really glad that Chris, you asked this question. I think the very, very important for the, uh, for the government, for the uh, um, research institutes to use this document and, uh, and feedback to us. Now in my previous presentations, um, I showed a, a report from SIA and uh, um, SRC, they report the, the future directions and they, they said something about the future is still, um, the future is still cloudy, um, but 
the potential is great. And I, I can't exactly remember how to phrase it, but I could see that, for example, in Europe, the European, um, I think the European uh, governments have band together and said they would like to be, um, what's the right word to say, semiconductor independent or what? And I've, I don't exactly remember the word, but I think the commission is pulling together and I, what we have in terms of our roadmap and what they are doing, I think will be important direction for us to see how they could use that document. So the way that we are out there to spread the word, like what you have been doing very diligently in the Eurosim, what you have been doing at the uh, Microtech next, uh, next couple of months, I think these are the directions for us to spread the word so that people can use the document, people can feedback to us. Beginning in uh, two years ago, we had uh, direct participation when we were meeting in person uh, from the US government. Um, not that we specifically invited them. He was, he was assigned and came to our in-person meetings. Bill, this is Dredge actually. Regarding the university, I would like to get an opportunity to present to you guys about the uh, center reforming reliability assessment and micro and power electronic systems focusing on heterogeneous integration. As I told you in your email yesterday, we have considerable funding we have received from the state of Texas. So, but we would like to get your direction, uh, so. Well, I think what you just described would be a tremendous um, areas in, in terms of cooperation, collaboration with your center. And uh, particularly in the area that you just mentioned, um, the, the, in my view is that with this, this, your center activities and the roadmap uh, cooperating, collaborating together would be a great way for us to contribute in every way we have in our technical working groups. Thanks, Bill.